All right, this is video 10 on the opening of the euthyphro, and I'll also be talking about a common philosophical technique called reflective equilibrium. Um, and that, uh, that's something that will come up again in later uh, European philosophers in particular. Okay, so to begin with, I had you answer some basic discussion questions in the forum. Some of them were just, uh, you know, be sure you did the reading kind of questions. So uh, who are the characters and what are they doing? Um, uh, the more interpretive questions uh, are two and three. What are the characters like as people? Um, and um, is Socrates being sarcastic uh, in a certain passage? And um, these are these are open questions. I'll, I'll actually circle back to them after we lay down the story. Um, people interpret, so particularly Socrates as a character, uh, differently. Some people have very positive reactions to him, and some people have very negative reactions to him. Um, in some ways, Euthyphro is uh, more of uh, more straightforward. Um, he is, in some ways, just the the chump of this dialogue. He's um, just the one being played. Um, but we can talk more about him as well. All right. So this is this is the scene. Socrates meets Euthyphro, who is a charismatic religious leader, uh, coming into the courthouse. Socrates has been charged with corrupting the young. Um. Euthyphro, on the other hand, has been charged, uh, is, is charging someone. He is charging his own father with murder. And the backstory here is complicated and kind of outlandish. So uh, one of Euthyphro's servants killed a slave in a drunken rage. Euthyphro's father bound the servant and threw him in a ditch while he went to get a priest to decide what to do. Um... While Euthyphro's father was looking for the priest, the servant died. So Euthyphro seems impious. He seems like he's doing something that is not normally religiously acceptable. He's prosecuting his own father. Uh, the man who died was a slave, and for the Greeks that would mean his death was less important. His father wasn't directly responsible for the killing, and the person who, who was killed was a murderer himself. So this all seems like a very weird thing to do. But Euthyphro insists that he's being completely consistent in doing it. Notice, by the way, how uh, horrifying this would be to a Confucian. Um, Confucius specifically says that you should not turn in your parents when they commit crimes. Um, so they, Socrates and Euthyphro have a dialogue here, and at least some of the time it seems like Socrates is being sarcastic. And how you respond to his sarcasm, uh, I think, makes a difference for what you think of um, Socrates as a person. But um, we're already sort of in a different teaching situation, as it were, than um, Confucius dealt with, right? Because he's not um, he doesn't have an official student. In fact, he's just grilling a random person he met on the way to court. Uh, someone who actually was looking for some solidarity. Um, so, because Euthyphro is doing something that seems impious, um, Socrates asks him what piety is. And then this becomes the central question of the dialogue. What is piety? Right? Piety isn't a word you ordinarily hear in English unless you're in a particular religious setting. Um, you know, in ordinary English, it just means holy or, you know, religiously good. Okay. Um, so, what happens when Euthyphro offers up, uh, when, when Socrates asks Euthyphro what piety is? Well, um... Euthyphro, the first thing that Euthyphro does is he gives an example, right? So this is what he says. Piety is what I am doing. It's prosecuting wrongdoers. And people will say that it's not right to prosecute your own father if he committed a murder, but I say the law is the law. 
right? Um, so this is a characteristic response um, for a lot of people who get interviewed by Socrates. Um, he asks for a definition and actually the first definition that they give is not really a definition in Socrates's mind. It's an example, right? Um, and that's what's going on here. Um, we get just one example of something that is pious. Um, and that means that other things that you might think of as very pious, like uh, praying or offering sacrifices to the gods, are not included in the definition. So it just doesn't work. Um, you can think about Socrates' response here in terms of an argument, right? We can say, if piety were defined just as prosecuting wrongdoers, if we took that not as an example of piety, but as the definition of piety, we would then be excluding things like offering sacrifices as pious actions. But we know offering sacrifices is a pious action. Therefore, conclusion, piety is not defined as prosecuting wrongdoers. So Euthyphro has to come up with another definition. Um, and this is, this is, again, really common when Socrates interviews people. He asks, what is an X? And someone just gives an example of an X. And Socrates says, I didn't ask for an example. I asked for the definition. Uh, and Euthyphro's second definition, which we'll be talking about in a later video, actually fits what Socrates is looking for. And he specifically says, ah, now you have answered me in the way that I wanted. Okay. So part of what's going on here in terms of method is um, that um, Socrates and Euthyphro are engaged in this process that we call reflective equilibrium. Um, the name was developed later, uh, people interpret it different ways, but it's got, uh, whenever people talk about it, they're talking about roughly the same kind of thing. Um, and this is a, a process that you undergo when you are trying to develop a rule, like a definition. And what happens is you've got some intuitions about particular cases. You might say something like, um, Offering sacrifices is a, definitely a good example of being pious. Praying is definitely a good example of being pious. So these are all cases that we think are uh, uh, examples. And then we try and find a definition that covers all of those cases and also doesn't cover other things that we think it shouldn't, right? Um, so in more detail, the method kind of looks like this. You propose a definition and you look for counterexamples. The counterexamples could either be items that seem like they should fall under the definition, but don't, or items that seem like they shouldn't fall under the definition, but do. And then if you find a counterexample, you have two options. You either change your definition, you say the my original proposal didn't work, or you change your intuition about the example. All right, so let's run through this with um, the example of uh, piety. Euthyphro's initial definition um, says that piety is prosecuting wrongdoers. So now let's just think about four actions that may or may not be considered pious. Prosecuting strangers, prosecuting family, praying, offering sacrifices. Um, Euthyphro's first definition captures two of these, prosecuting strangers and prosecuting family. Now, the accusation that gets made against Euthyphro is that this definition doesn't work. Um, the accusation that other people have been making against him is that this definition doesn't work because it is 
it is impious to prosecute your own fa father for murder. So saying that it's impious to prosecute your father for murder would be a counterexample because it's something that is included in the circle that uh, other people think shouldn't be included. But Euthyphro, in, when he sees this counterexample, decides to stick with his definition um, and challenge the counterexample. So he, he says, oh, you may think prosecuting your family is impious, but actually it is very pious because it's enforcing the law. So he is standing by his definition here in red that um, prosecuting wrongdoers is pious. Um, and he is changing his intuition about a particular case. He's challenging other people's intuitions about a particular case that prosecuting family is impious. However, um, oh, so this slide actually just says what I just said. Uh, he uh, includes prosecuting family, but here he says that it's our intuitions that should be changed, not the definition of piety or holiness. Where Euthyphro messes up is that his definition fails to capture things. There are two things outside of the circle, uh, praying and offering sacrifices, that should be inside the circle. So basically the whole game of reflective equilibrium is a matter of trying to draw a circle that captures the things you want and only the things you want, right? So to give you another example, um, I want to talk about an idea called moral status. Um, this is not in Plato, um, but uh, I'm, I'm showing you this to illustrate how reflective equilibrium works with a separate example, right? So moral status is the status of an object with regard to whether you have moral duties to it. All right, that sounds weird and abstract. Think of it this way. We know we have moral duties to other um, human beings, right? It, and that means that if I, for instance, punch you in the face, I have done a wrong to you. On the other hand, if I slash the tires of your car, I haven't done a wrong to your car. I've done a wrong to you. That's because you have moral status and your car does not. Car is just an inanimate object, right? So the idea is that something has moral status if you owe it something. And we have some agreement on what kinds of things have moral status. We're having this conversation now and you uh, and I both regard each other as having the moral status, we say, of a person which means it's wrong to kill them. Um, there are other things though, and a lot of very famous political disagreements come with the question whether a thing has moral status. So although we will all agree that um, uh, adult, normal adult humans like ourselves have moral status, whether a fetus or an embryo has moral status is uh, one of the cores of the abortion debate, right? We argue about that. Um, whether animals have moral status is the core of the debate over, among other things, vegetarianism. So the idea is that you have moral status if you have direct duties to something. Um, if you can say, you did that thing a wrong, not like you broke that thing, um, and it was a wrong that maybe what happened to someone else or maybe it just doesn't matter, right? So uh, if I'm in a physical classroom, it used to be I would have a piece of chalk and I could say, um, well, we all agree that chalk does not have moral status. If I crunch up this piece of chalk, I have not done a wrong to the chalk or to anyone. In general, if something has moral status, things can be better or worse for it. Right? You can say, oh man, things are going bad for a fetus um, because it's, it, it's sick. Right? Um, things are going bad 
for uh, a squirrel because it can't find any nuts. So let's do some reflective equilibrium here. Here's a bunch of things that you might think have moral status. And in the center are normal adults who are the normal adults who are having this conversation. Um, and that's something that we can say um, we, we typically just start as, well, we definitely have moral status, but what else does? Um, people who almost always agree that a newborn baby has moral status, um, right? Baby is so cute. Um, when you start to look before birth, however, the issue gets complicated. A late-term fetus, a lot of people, even who are pro-choice, become uncomfortable thinking about aborting a late-term fetus. Earlier fetuses, less, perhaps less controversial. Embryos. So an embryo doesn't even have human shape yet. Um, you know, uh, the first 14 days, it's just a collection of cells. And uh, uh, if you believe that people who use the status life begins at conception will say that an embryo has moral status. The phrase life begins at conception is kind of misleading because you can say, yeah, an embryo is alive, but that wasn't really the issue. The issue is whether it has moral status. All right. So that's a bunch of humans in the lower left corner. Um, we also can talk about dogs and cats. Most people think that their dog, who are dog and cat owners, believe that their dogs and cats have, you know, if you kick the dog, you've done something wrong to the dog, and you say, poor dog. Pigs are just like, have, those, have, have, have very similar animals to dogs and cats, but people take very different attitudes towards them. Insects starting to go out there. Um, and with an insect, it's not clear that it actually it has any feelings. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, I put intelligent machines because it's a common trope in science fiction that robots demand uh, rights. In fact, the very first um, uh, play to use the word robot, uh, Rossum's Universal Robots by a Czech playwright was about robots demanding rights. Um, so intelligent machines, permanently comatose. Some people think that once you become a vegetable at the end of life, you're actually already dead. Um, so you don't have a moral status. Um, and then there's a lot of complicated issues there because vegetable isn't a medical term. It's kind of pejorative. Right. Um, you uh, but, you know, what what kind of uh, comatose state might actually constitute being already dead? All right. So reflective equilibrium, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a circle around some of these things and not others. A common circle to draw is what uh, in philosophy, we, we will call the sentience standard. Sentience means being able to feel, right? So dogs, cats, pigs, um, they can all, they all have feelings. Um, you kick a dog, it, it whimpers. Um, a dog has desires. My dogs will tell me when they want to go outside. And of course, same for... Um, newborns, and probably even late-term fetuses, although it's harder to tell, but not for a human being that's permanently comatose. They're um, unconscious, so they're not feeling anything. Also, we can imagine machines that have feelings. So if you buy this standard, the can-it-feel standard, you wind up with a certain set of moral um, uh, imperatives, right? Uh, and, and I think in particular, you would think, you would say that um, the way, way, way we treat pigs currently is appalling compared to the way we treat dogs and cats, right? Other people might say that that's the treatment of pigs is a counterexample here. This definition requires us to treat pigs with, um, you know, not eat them, um, not raise them in these you know, gestation cages where they can't turn around. That's hard. That's a dumb idea. We'll ditch the standard. Well, so some people, when they ditch the standard, say, oh, well, it being able to feel isn't the right thing. 
The important thing is whether you, it can think. Um, and here, think means something about higher cognitive processes, not just have emotions, but reason and use language and argue for its right to have rights, uh, argue that it has rights, right? Um, and so um, the philosophical term for this is sapience, right? Um, so something has sentience if it can feel the way a dog or a cat can feel, and sapience if it can uh, think and reason and talk uh, the way human beings do. Um, and I should note that if you're a science fiction fan and you, uh, uh, well, a lot of science fiction shows consistently say sentience when they mean sapience. So, um, you know, on Star Trek does this all the time. Uh, they, they scan the planet for life forms and Commander Data says there's sentient life down there. And actually what he doesn't mean is things like dogs and cats. He means um, uh, space aliens that will be played by humans and will talk in human language and communicate with Picard. And so they say sentience there, but they actually mean sapience. Um, same is going on... Uh, uh, for shows where there is a robot or uh, on Star Trek, like a hologram that will start demanding its rights and talking and saying, I want to have a name. Um, all of that is really about sapience. So people can turn to the sapience standard if they don't want uh, to include pigs, for instance, in the realm of things that have moral status. But what else gets excluded? Newborn babies. Newborn babies don't talk, don't um, use language to argue for their rights. Um, and that seems wrong. <sighs> okay. Uh, yet another standard that is common, particularly amongst religious conservatives, is what I'm going to call the what 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 gets called the biologically human standard. So any part of the human life cycle, from an embryo um, right up to the moment of death, even if um, the, the person is permanently comatose, um, all of these stages of your life, you have the full moral status of a person, and for instance, uh, terminating you is all, always wrong. Um, this, uh, this has actually pretty deep roots in, in, in Christian thought, um, including the idea that animals don't have souls, right? So um, if you've ever heard a particularly old-fashioned kind of uh, priest or preacher insist that dogs don't go to heaven because animals don't have souls, that's going to be right here. Um, and you can see already, if you're a dog or a cat owner, why the biologically human standard seems... Um, uh, too, too narrow in some ways. It also excludes intelligent machines, space aliens, um, right? It's, it's really just, it's, it's just our species are bust. So reflective equilibrium. You have a desire to stay with a consistent and plausible definition that has to be balanced against intuitions about individual cases. Okay, so that's reflective equilibrium, and that's also the first definition that came up in um, the Euthyphro. Uh, Euthyphro. Euthyphro's next move is going to be pr to propose a definition that is more like what Socrates wants out of a definition, and uh, Socrates is going to challenge it using slightly different techniques.